Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the BRAG, Brazilian Algebraic Geometry Seminar. It is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Eduardo Esteves from IMPA. And today he's going to tell us about the generations of line bundles and divisors along families of curves. Please, Eduardo. Okay, thank you, Carolina. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak here at BRAG. Uh, I'm gonna give a, not the same talk, but I gave this talk about a few weeks ago in a workshop at, uh, of our group. And I have just half an hour. So I'm glad that I have uh, another half an hour to maybe go in a different pace and present some more details. So the title, basically says it all. It's a variation of uh, all the titles that of all the talks I've given in the past years. Uh, so the generations of line bundles and divisors along families of curves. But in this talk, for the first time, I, I try to combine the works that I've been doing with several people. So with Omid Amini from the Ecole Polytechnique, uh, with uh, Pierre Rodriguez, Renan Santos, and Eduardo Vital, students at IMPA, and Daniel Santana, who was a student at IMPA as well. Okay, so I start uh, with an example. It's, it's nice to see some pictures and uh, to explain what kind of issues that I'm interested in. So I'm interested in uh, families of curves. So that's one simple example, a pencil of, of curves. And I'm looking at families that degenerate to a, a singular curve. In this case, the triangle curve, union of the lines X, Y, and Z. So I'm picking a, a, a general pencil degenerating to, to this triangle. So F is a general cubic, okay? And I want to consider uh, uh, line bundles and divisors along this family. So uh, let's look at divisors first. So we consider the system cut out by lines on this pencil, okay? So the question is how do the divisors uh, degenerate as t goes to zero? So some of these divisors, it's easy to see the degeneration. So if you have a, a line like that, right? Then uh, you see that uh, no matter how it intersects a general member of the pencil as t goes to zero, it will intersect uh, the triangle in these three points, one on each line of the triangle. Mm -hmm. Now, the situation is a bit more complicated than when you have one of these three lines, X, Y, or Z, because they intersect the triangle in infinitely many points. So let's look at one of the lines, X equals to zero. And uh, let me ask what happens with uh, the divisor given by x equals to zero as t goes to zero. Now it's, it's somewhat simple actually, if uh, you fix the divisor x equals to zero, uh, the line and you intersect. So what you do, you replace the, the, the first equation in the second equation and you get t times f equals to zero, t being non zero f is equal to zero. So that's uh, the divisor on the general member, in fact, it doesn't move. And the limit then is this intersection of x equals to zero and f equals to zero. So three points, three general points on the line as f is general. Okay, so the question then is, is how to put these things together? Because of course, I mean, if you have the line equals to, to zero, it's, it's a limit of other lines in the pencil. But if you look at the divisors that I'm presenting to you, I mean, this one here and this one here, they're very different, right? You can have a line degenerating to x equals to zero, but certainly this divisor doesn't degenerate to this one here. And all the three points here on the line x equals to zero. So, so what's going on? So how does this fit with the others? So as I was saying, we may fix the special curve and move the line. So that was exactly what I was explaining. If you look at the line degenerating to x equals to zero, then you can compute the limit of the intersection. And uh, uh, so here I'm picking this beta t, gamma t, uh, our power series, if you want. 
And uh, as uh, uh, so, so what's the idea here? You do the same. You replace this equation inside here, and then you get t that you can divide by and make t equals to zero. And then you see that the limit is simply this. Okay. So what's this limit? It's a bunch of points on the line x equals to zero, but you see that uh, two of these points are the nodes, and uh, the third point is variable. So that's what you get, and that's not close to this. So what's going on? So, so far, what we have done was we fixed the line x equals to zero and let the curve vary in the pencil, and we fixed the curve and let the line vary. So uh, let's do something different. Let's uh, make all of them vary at the same time. Okay, so if we do that, then uh, we can do exactly the same, right? We can replace this equation inside here, but now we have this f, t times f, and when we divide by t and make t equals to zero, you still have f here. Of course, when you make t equals to zero here, you still get x equals to zero, but now you get a, 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 a different set of points here because uh, you have f appearing here. So you see that you can actually, uh, as you do it simultaneously, you can get a, a, a different collection of divisors here. And in fact, what we get is a net of divisors on x equal to zero cut out by the system of cubics, y square z, y z square, and f equals to zero. Okay, so, so you have a picture of, of, of cubics there, right? If you make the coefficient of f equals to zero, that's a p1, that means that you get uh, 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 these, uh, these divisors here, right, on this P1, but in general, you get a, a, a different collection of, of points, right? And you can get the three general points on, on the line, right? Which is the case, the intersection with just F. Okay, so we can actually put all of these, parameterize all of these divisors that appear uh, using a surface. And that's the surface that I'm gonna to use to parameterize those. So what we do here, we take the P2 duo. So the P2 parameterizing lines on P2, right? So the, uh, the, the alpha, beta, and gamma are the coordinates of the points, but also the coefficients of the line. If you have a general line here, that is none of those uh, three lines of the triangle, then you have a particular divisor, the intersection that I talked about, right? As you approach this line to one of these points here, then you have a different collection of uh, divisors, which are these, right? So that means that you have to blow up uh, the points on Pichu Duo to get uh, the exceptional divisors here. And exceptional divisors, each of them will parameterize the divisors, in this case, on x equal to zero. This is part of the divisors that we found. But we saw that there is actually a net of divisors, which is given by, by these, right? And what we're doing, in fact, is picking a P2 and uh, gluing with uh, the blow up of P2 at three points at the exceptional divisor. Okay? And we do it for every exceptional divisor, and you get the surface with four components parameterizing all the limits of divisors. Okay. So that's the picture. Any question? Okay, if not, then I'll make the questions myself. And in fact, uh, I can make several questions here. Uh, first of all, are these all the limits of divisors? Of course, I mean, uh, 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 as I told you, I mean, each point on this surface parameterizes certainly one limit. And we have a projective surface. So maybe these are all the limits of divisors, but uh, I haven't proved that. The second question, what's this surface actually? Because it's, it's very schematic uh, what, uh, well, it's a scheme, but it's, it's very, uh, uh, how can I say it? Uh, it's, it's almost a draft. I mean, I haven't really proved anything. I mean, uh, there is a scheme structure there and uh, 
I haven't really looked at it. So what's the surface? How did I arrive at the surface, for instance? Okay, the third question is an interesting one because uh, what we do, do we study linear systems? Well, uh, if you have a PN of divisors, that gives me a map to PN. Right? So here I, had a, I have a P2 of divisors and I can ask, uh, do I have a map to the surface parameterizing the divisors? So do you see the triangle on the surface above? So the triangle is in, in P2, right? But not in P2 duo, and I put P2 duo there. In fact, the question is not well phrased. We have to look at the dual in, to get the map, right? So a better question would be this. I mean, a PN of divisors gives rise to a map to PN duo. And then um, what's the dual of the above surface? So if I want to look at maps, then I want to do something dual. What's the dual of the above surface? Can you see some duality here? Okay, so that's already four questions or maybe three. Right? And uh, so this question is, is there a general picture? I mean, uh, this is just an example, right? So can I, can I say something in more generality? Well, I'll have an answer to all of these uh, five questions. And uh, I can start by giving a, a short answers to, to each of those. And uh, let's look at the questions first. Are these all limits of divisors? Yes. What's this surface? And uh, let me answer it now uh, by looking at this quiver representation. So here we have a quiver. We have four vertices and six arrows. And we have a three-dimensional quiver representation. Uh, I've already put in terms of bases here. So the matrices uh, are that give the map are, are as I put there, right? They are all diagonal matrices. And we have this quiver representation. And the associated quiver Grassmannian of a one-dimensional sub-representations, pure one-dimensional representations, LPG is the surface that I have drawn. So here we have the scheme structure. It's given by this LPG. And uh, an intriguing maybe uh, uh, association between uh, the geometric problem that I've been uh, working with and, and representation theory and the geometry associated to the representation theory of quivers. Okay, so that's the surface. And, uh, uh, and then I can answer the, the, the third question or the fourth question, what is the dual of that surface? Well, geometrically it's, it's not easy, but if you have a representation, then you can talk about the dual of the representation and look at uh, the associated uh, Grassmannian of one-dimensional subspaces, LPG dual. So by giving this structure, I can talk about the dual of the surface and I will draw this LPG dual to you at the end of the talk. And then answer this question, is it isomorphic to LPG as in the case of the projective space? And the answer is no, it's not isomorphic. It, it's, a, it's a very different surface. Okay, so uh, we'll see the connections now because I want to do the general theory. Any questions so far? Sorry, I, I, I'm a bit lost. What is G, G is a representation or is it a space of? of it, it's a special representation that arises from the degeneration. Okay, so I'm using this, this letter G to denote this representation, oh, I cannot write, this particular representation here. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right. Any more questions? So let me show you now how in general we have this representation 
and what's the relation with uh, divisors. Okay. So general theory, we're gonna look at a, a family of curves, uh, one parameter of family of curves over the base space, it's B. I can look infinitesimally if I want, it's one dimensional uh, B. And I'm looking at, at, at a family of, of curves over this B uh, where the general member is smooth, but the special fiber is uh, a nodal curve. So when you uh, have this family, you have a surface here and this surface might be singular. In fact, the singularities occur just at the nodes of the special fiber and we can resolve them. That's semi-stable reduction as we say it. So what happens is that we blow up and we blow up and then what we do is we replace this special curve by another curve where the branches now are connected by a chain of P1s, a chain of rational curves, okay? So the number of uh, components in this chain is according to uh, how singular that point is in the surface. All of these singularities are of the A type. So they depend just on that, uh, that uh, number AN and uh, the number of components is N minus one. Now we don't change the special, uh, the, the general fiber, it's the same. We blow up just the, along the special fiber. And if we have a divisor on the general fiber, that means uh, a, a line bundle and a section of this line bundle, okay? Then what we can do is that since uh, uh, we blew up and we get something which is smooth, or regular if you want, then we can extend the line bundle to a line bundle over the total space X tilde. Okay? Not in general to X, but to X tilde. Okay? So we can extend the line bundle and it can extend the section. So we get for each extension of L eta, uh, uh, a section as L, uh, uh, which extends as eta. The thing is that there are infinitely many extensions L if X is reducible. In fact, uh, if you have an extension uh, here, you can just tensor it with the line bundle associated to any component on the special fiber, right? And that line bundle is trivial on the general fiber, so it doesn't change the restriction of L to the general. So each component, uh, each divisor on X tilde supported on uh, on these components here, you get infinity mean extensions. In fact, uh, you can say that the extension is determined by uh, the so-called multi-degree, right? So if you have a, a line bundle on uh, X tilde, X tilde is, uh, I didn't put it here, but it's the, the special fiber here, and this is X and that's X tilde, right? And then what you can do, you can restrict it to every component of X tilde and look at the degree on every component. That's uh, why I use this dash here. It's the multi-degree associated to L. And uh, you might not get all possible multi-degrees, but uh, extensions with the same multi-degree are isomorphic. But anyway, I mean, you have infinitely many extensions. But now given, uh, we're talking about the line bundles, but we have a section. If you have a section, then there is a unique extension such that uh, when you look at the extended section and restrict X tilde, the zero locus is finite. So the idea is very simple. You just pick any extension. You just pick any uh, uh, SL. This SL might vanish on uh, some of the components of X tilde, then you subtract them with the appropriate multiplicities until you get a section that doesn't vanish on any component, a section of a different uh, line bundle, okay? So that line bundle, which is modified, uh, uh, L modified at the components of the special fiber, it's again an extension of L eta, and uh, you get uh, this special section with a finite zero locus. In fact, it's the limit on X tilde of the zero locus of the general section. 
Okay. So if you look at the general section, it uh, will have uh, some points here where it uh, it's zero, right? The general fiber is the same, so you have the same points here, and then you can look at the limits of these points inside the special fiber and uh, this collection of points on Xcuda is the zero locus of that uh, SL, that special extension. Okay. Now, we're talking about the limit on Xcuda and interestingly, the limit on X itself. Of course, I mean, uh, what it might happen is that uh, uh, for this L here, some of these points, they live on the exceptional components, the components you create. In fact, we can see it from the multi-degree of L on X tilde. So for instance, it could have this multi-degree. Mm -hmm. So that's saying that uh, the zero locus here uh, consists of five points on this uh, P1, three points on this P1, one point on this P1. For instance, no, no point here. Right? So you can have uh, 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 the points distributed along the exceptional components. If you want just to get the limit on the curve X, the original curve as a veil divisor, as a collection of points with weights, then you have all the weights, here, right? So you have eight, uh, weight eight at this node here, connecting this, these two branches, or uh, weight one here, weight zero here. But if you want to get actually the scheme structure uh, as, a, as a scheme, as a sub-scheme, then uh, that's not, the appropriate thing to do. What we can actually do is the following. We can pick the, the, our section, which has finitely zero locus here on X tilde, and then add some exceptional components to get a different section of a different extension. And we can do that in such a way that the degree, the multi-degree of this new extension is admissible on X tilde. So that's a terminology that people have been using uh, quite a lot. And what it means is that the multi-degree of this, uh, this extension here on the exceptional components looks like this multi-degree here or this one here. That means the degree is zero on every component in the chain with the exception of at most one component where the degree is one. Okay. So I have sometimes to modify my line bundle to get to this line bundle with multi-degree, admissible multi-degree, right? And in this particular example here, I don't need to add any exceptional components here, neither here, but I have to add exceptional components here. And if I do that, then uh, I've drawn here what I get. I have four components here, and at the end, what you get is degree zero everywhere except one. Okay, so, so why do we care to get an admissible uh, uh, thing is that when you push it down now, because it's a blow up, so it can push down by the blow up map. We push down the structure shift, we get the structure sheet. We push down the section itself, we get a section then of uh, this push forward. And when uh, L tilde has admissible multi-degree, what we get is a flat family of torsion free rank one sheets. So that means that uh, uh, actually the push forward commutes with uh, uh, taking the fiber. And uh, if I take the fiber here, what I get is a sheath, uh, which on the general fiber is just invertible, the original L eta, but on the special fiber is a torsion free rank one sheet. So a torsion free rank one sheaf is simply an ideal sheaf of a, a finite subscheme tensored with a line bundle. But that's crucial because now when I restrict to the special fiber, what I get is a section of this sheaf here, I, and uh, this kind of sections have been studied before. So sections of torsion free rank one sheaves correspond to certain subschemes of X, which have been called pseudo divisors by Hartshorn. So this is a, a work in the 
70s or 80s by heart from me. Uh, I don't remember well, or maybe 90s. But uh, the idea is very simple. When you have a section of a torsion free rank one shear, what you can do is you can consider it's a zero locals. Uh, that means you can take the dual, right? And uh, this section here is injective, right? As a, as a section of a sheaf, because uh, the original section was uh, injective at the components of X or all the components. When I uh, compose, the section may fail to be injective, but just at the exceptional components. So that means that this section here is actually, when I put it that way, an injective homomorphism. And then when I take the dual, it's again injective. So that means that uh, its image is a sheaf of ideals of uh, a subscheme of uh, finite lengths. Okay. So that's how I define this zero uh, scheme of, of this section, right? It's just take the dual and look at the sheaf of ideals. This has been uh, done by Hachon in, in, uh, in a different context. Uh, he worked with uh, all kinds of curves, even curves which are non gorenstein and then you have to be a bit careful. But here it's simply this. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, that's the limit of uh, the divisor. So if I want to look at the limit of those red points that you do on, uh, on the uh, general fiber, on the curve itself on X, right? You get it with the seam structure by looking at uh, this section. Any questions here? Now, you might think that you don't need to deal with torsion free rank point shifts in the special case, which was the case of my example, where the general where the surface X is uh, smooth already, right? So if the surface X is smooth, then all extensions, I, I don't need to do the push forward. I have only to deal with uh, uh, invertible extensions, okay? That's not true. That's not true and I'll explain why. Even when the total space is regular, you have to consider those kinds of sheets. Uh, let me go back here. So that's what I said, that it might seem that uh, if X is equal to X tilde, we don't need to handle torsion free rank point sheets, but that's false. And what happens is the following. Uh, if the base field infinitesimally is the power series, the ring of power series, the residual field of the general point is the field of lower Hans series, which is not algebraically closed. So we might want to consider sections of L eta, which are not defined over the field, but over an algebraic extension of the field, which in this case, in characteristic zero, means uh, looking at Puiseux series or doing a base change, T to some T delta. And when you do this base change, the total space of the family becomes singular. So I have to blow it up. And you can see that in the example itself. Uh, as I said here, this is important uh, to get projectivity to consider all possible sections, not just those defined over, uh, over the field, but uh, on any extension of the field. So let's look at the example to see that happening. So in the example, uh, uh, the, the, some of the divisors that happened were of this type here, if you remember. All right. And the thing is that this is not a Cartier divisor. This is not the zero locus of a section of a line bundle because a section of a line bundle wouldn't have uh, a, zero, uh, uh, a zero here of multiplicity one at the node. It would be at least two, right? So this is, these are not Cartier divisors here, right? Of course, I mean, this is the, the singular point, right? And uh, what's going on if we look at the picture and compare to the general theory that I've just uh, talked to you, is that uh, uh, when you look at, uh, at the section and look at the, the line bundle uh, 
for which the section is, uh, has finite zero locals. So what happens is that if we are in the P2 dual, if we are in a, a point different from these three, then you have these divisors here and uh, uh, they, they are uh, the zero locals of sections of uh, degree one, 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 like that's the mode of degree, which corresponds to a line, right? Intersecting the lines of the triangle in three points, one on each component. Right? These here, these sections here, they, they are the three points on X, right? So they correspond to sections of a line bundle of this degree, three, zero, zero, which is a different line bundle. Of course, you have a line bundle of degree zero, three, zero, and zero, zero, three here, but then you still have those points in here which correspond to the example that I, uh, uh, I just put here, this one here, right? And uh, these, these divisors here are not sections, uh, uh, they don't correspond to sections of line bundle. In fact, they correspond to sections of uh, torsion field and point sheaves. And to get them, I need to do this base change. So you see, to get something projective, I have to add these guys here. So, uh, any questions? So the question then is, uh, uh, what are those uh, different? If you want to look at uh, all limits of divisors, then you have to look at uh, at least uh, a certain number of uh, limits of the line bundle, right? And uh, uh, how do I describe those limits? So that's the, the work I've been doing with uh, Amini which is uh, to understand the structure of all the eyes of all the limits of L8 uh, of the line bundle that appear. And in fact, there is a combinatorial structure, which is very interesting. Uh, if we look at V, the number of irreducible components of X, then you can look at uh, the space of uh, real valued functions on V. You have a, a degree map, you just take the sum of the values for every irreducible component. Mm -hmm. And if D is the degree of my line bundle, the number of points in the divisor, then I want to look at this, uh, this space here. This is a affine subspace, which is uh, the functions that have a degree exactly D. So the idea is that I look at this RV as some real valued multi-degree on my original curve X. And I'm looking here at the real valued multi-degrees of total degree. Okay. So it's, it's an affine space. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, there is a decomposition of this affine space in polytopes, each corresponding to one of these sheaves in the limit R. Each polytope is made of polarization polytopes. So let me explain what are these. As I said, I can look at uh, uh, the elements of HDV as multi-degrees, and I can look at them as polarizations as well. So a depolarization is simply a, an element of HDV. And why do we call it polarization? What can we do with that? Well, there is a notion of a stability or semi-stability that comes from a GIT that has been used a lot in this theory. We say that a torsion-free rank one shift I of degree D is semi-stable with respect to Q or Q semi-stable. That's the technical definition right down here. But uh, what it says is that uh, the multi-degree of this shift here uh, should not be far from the multi-degree Q. And the difference between them is bounded by this number here. And this number has, uh, uh, is connected to the combinatorial, to the combinatorics of the curve. So delta here is the number of points between uh, these two subcurves of, uh, of my curve X. So I don't want to deal much with, uh, it's, it's a bit technical this, but the idea that you should have in mind is that what this is saying is that uh, the degree of, uh, the multi-degree of my sheet should not be far from, from Q. 
All right, so the bottom line is, is what I said here. And uh, what we can do is that for each sheaf I as above, we can consider its stability polytope, which is uh, the set of uh, polarizations Q such that I is Q semi-stable. So we invert this thing, right? So we have, now we have the sheaf and we ask for which polarizations my sheaf is Q semi-stable. And what we get is a polytope. In fact, uh, when you look at the condition here, the semi-stability condition, you see that uh, these are integers and these are half integers. So uh, this is a real thing, but uh, it, it's uh, sort of bounded by uh, 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 the boundaries that we have here. Uh, it's a it's an countable collection of hyperplots. So what I'm saying here is the following is that uh, since the degrees of, of uh, the multi-degree of the sheaves are integers, then each PI is a union of the polarization polytopes. So I have two types of polytopes. There is the stability polytope associated to the sheaf I and the polarization polytope, which is associated to the curve. And the, these polarization polytopes arise from the hyperplane arrangement. So you see what I have here, is a, a finding number of hyperplanes. So for every uh, uh, subcurve of, of my curve X, so, so every union of irreducible components, I can look at uh, the value of Q in the union, which is the sum of the values of Q, right? And I, I, for every integer, I can look at this hyperplane. And then you have a, a countable number of hyperplanes, and I can look at the components of them. So they crowd the plane and they give you polytopes. And this is stability polytopes, they are unions of these polarization polytopes. So let's see what's going on in the example. Okay, so in the example, we have uh, just three components, was a triangle, right? HDV has codimension one in RV. So sometimes it's useful to just choose one of the reducible components, put it away, and look at the projection of this into here. Okay. So instead of looking at the polytopes here, I'm going to look at the polytopes here. And the advantage is that this is R2 in our example. So what kind of polytopes that we get? So look at the picture here. In fact, let me tell you that uh, since we're dealing with a general pencil, for that example, that particular example, the polytopes that we get are just the hexagons, just these polytopes here, the black hexagons, okay? But if we take a, a, any torsion free Venkman sheaf on the triangle, its polarization polytope can be a, a, a certain number of polytopes. So it could be a, a square, it could be one of these parallelograms, there is this one here and this one here, and the purple things that I'm drawing here, the purple polytopes, which are triangles in this case, they are the polarization polytopes. Okay. So you see that uh, each polytope here is made of uh, this polarization polytopes. In the case of hexagon, there are six of them. In the case of the square and the parallelograms, there are just two of them. These are not the only polytopes that you see in the picture, these are the maximal dimensional polytopes or the two dimensional polytopes in this case. In fact, the segments here are also polytopes that correspond to sheets that cannot be stable, just semi-stable. And the vertices also correspond to polytopes as well. So what I'm meaning here is that if you look at this region here, and if you look at the degeneration, then you're gonna get a limit, a torsion free rank one sheaf for each of the polytopes you see in this region. There are the three maximal dimensional polytopes. There are the three one dimensional polytopes and there is uh, this zero dimensional polytope. So that's it. That's, that's how many sheaves that you get actually, all of these. 
in fact, there is a, is, a, is a nice interplay between the combinatorics and, and uh, uh, the properties of the sheaves. So for instance, the sheaves that correspond to the maximal dimensional polytopes, they are simple sheaves. That means that they don't decompose as sum of sheaves. And in fact, in this picture here, I didn't write, but I can tell you, the hexagon corresponds to invertible sheaves and uh, the parallelograms correspond to sheaves that fail to be invert by that single node of the triangle. So these are still simple sheaves. The sheaves that correspond to the segments fail to be invert by two points. These are not simple sheaves. And the sheaves corresponding to the point here, uh, they fail to be invert by every node. Okay? So this is the, the worst picture where you have a decomposition of the sheet into three subsheets, to the sum of three subsheets. Okay. But uh, in fact, this additional data here is already given when you look at the simple sheets, they're degenerations the of these sheets. Okay. So if I want to look at all possible limits, I can actually look at all the simple limits, which is nice because uh, simple sheets are easier to parameterize. So there is actually a scheme parameterizing simple sheaves. And if they're not simple, then yeah, you have to consider those classes. The picture is not so nice. All right, but uh, we've been talking about the section that arises before, right? And we could have that the section corresponds to a sheaf which is not simple. In fact, that, that's what happened in the example of the triangle some of the, the sections that arise, they don't correspond to simple sheets. Okay. And uh, if you want just to deal with them, then what can we do here? Well, that begins the connection between uh, uh, quiver representations and, uh, and, and uh, what I've been doing here is that uh, we actually have to look at the, the polytope decomposition. The polytope of a sheaf, which is not simple, is in the boundary of a certain number of maximal dimensional polytopes corresponding to simple sheaves. So in this case, if I look at, uh, in the example, if I look at the sheaf uh, I4, it's in the boundary of these two polytopes corresponding to these two simple sheaves. I7 is in the boundary of three polytopes corresponding to these three simple sheaves. In general, you could have a, a certain number of sheaves let's say M of them, right? And what happens is that uh, we get uh, not only the section associated to, to the sheaf I, but also the section associated to the sheaf IJ, which is the composition here. Now, this is a not good section because it vanishes on uh, some of the components of the special curve. But if you put all of them together and we take the dual, if this map phi is surjective, then the intersection of all the zero loci of these sections is the zero locus that I'm looking at. Now that has been proved in, uh, in uh, two cases at least, the case where the number of components is two by Daniel Santana and in the case where the number of components is same. That's, that's saying that the thing that, I mean, if you want to consider uh, 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 the section of uh, as associated to a, a non-simple sheaf, you don't need to. You just need to consider simple sheaves, but not just a single section. You have to consider all of the sections of uh, the uh, uh, associated to the polytopes. And the corollary is what I said. The zero loci, because this is subjective, the zero locus here is the same as the zero locus of of this map here, which is an intersection of the zero loss. Okay, so, so that means that uh, instead of considering just one limit section, we want to consider actually a collection of limit sections. And in fact, we can consider all of them, why not? So that's uh, how, what we're gonna do. And uh, for that, I'm gonna assume from now on that X is equal to X tilde. Right? That's what we, worked on so far. And uh, there is a quiver now associated to the maximum dimension of polytopes okay? or to the multi degrees of the extensions if you want. So in the example, as I said, in the example, the polytopes are just the hexagons 
and the hexagons are going to be the vertices of the quiver. And between two hexagons that share a facet, there's going to be an error. So we have a quiver. And if you have a system of sections degenerating, uh, a system of sections of a beta, it will degenerate to a quiver representation. Right? So you're going to get a, a, a system of sections for each line bundle that arises as a limit. And in fact, there is going to be maps between them. And that's why we get this quiver representation. So that's the quiver representation that uh, I mentioned to you before, for example. We don't need to consider all the hexagons, but only finally many of them. So that's what I did there. I just picked the four hexagons there. And a section corresponds to a sub-representation of G of dimension one. Okay. So that's why we've been trying to understand what happens with, uh, with this sub-representation, how to parameterize that. The quiver and the representation are special, and we were able to discover what are the properties that make them special. So Q is a ZN quiver, where N is the number of components minus one, and G is what we call a link the net of vector spaces over Q. So let me give you an idea of what these are, right? And G has a special property in this case, it's exact, okay? So, so let me tell you what a ZN quiver and what the linked net is, just by giving an example, which is actually our example, if you want, All right? So here we have uh, this quiver, the vertices are here, the arrows are here, so we have the quiver, okay? So uh, a ZN quiver has uh, the composition of the arrow set in N plus one subsets, so in this example here, you have the vertical arrows, you have the horizontal arrows, and you have the diagonal arrows. So this decomposition is part of the ZN structure on the quiver. Okay. Given that this quiver is special in the sense that from each vertex, I can get to any other vertex by following the arrows. So there is this path connecting this here. And more than that, in fact, you can connect uh, do you want to be true just using admissible paths? So what's an admissible path? It's a path that uses all types of arrows except one. So in this case, the blue path here uses the vertical arrows and the diagonal arrows, but not the horizontal ones. So a path that uses all types of arrows, it's called non-admissible. And this quiver is special because there could be several admissible paths connecting these two vertices, but uh, the number of arrows of each type that appears is the same. So the blue path here uses three vertical arrows. The purple path here uses three vertical arrows. So that's a ZN quiver in this example. And what's a link the net? So a link the net, is a representation of the quiver. So it's uh, of pure dimension. We associate to the arrows maps, right? And one of the properties is that if I have two admissible paths connecting the same two vertices, then the composition of maps associated to the arrows should be the same. Okay? So if that doesn't depend on the admissible path I choose, then I actually have a map that connects uh, view one to be two. It depends just on the source and the end of the path. So that's one condition. Mm -hmm. The other condition is that if I have a path that uses all types of arrows, the associated map phi must be zero. In particular, if I have distinct vertices and I go from one to the other and back, the composition should be zero. There's one extra condition which is very important as well, is that if I have two admissible paths, such that uh, the types of arrows used are distinct, then their kernels should intersect in zero. Okay. So you see, these are just uh, linear representation theoretical properties. There's also the property of exactness that I put here. And what happens is that uh, here we have a complex, right? Because the composition is zero. 
But if the representation is exact, that means that uh, the image of this map should be the kernel of this map if v1 and v2 are neighbors, okay? These v1 and v2 are not neighbors, but if v2 were these or, or these, then they would be neighbors. And then uh, this condition of exactness, uh, I mean, could be checked. Okay? So that's the kind of representations and the kind of uh, quivers that we get from uh, a linear series. And then we started to study them with these properties. So that's work with uh, Renan Santos and Eduardo Vital. We just worked the case with n equals to two, and we considered a linked net over a Z2 quiver. And then we have these three uh, statements here. So if G has dimension one, then G is generated by a triangle. So that means that there is a special triangle in the quiver that uh, just look at the sections uh, uh, corresponding to G uh, or the spaces corresponding to G there and you get all the spaces. Mm -hmm. Second property is that G is exact, this LPG is co-emacal. So that's a nice property to have. And in fact, it's used to prove this third property here that if G arises from the generation of a linear series with a total space regular, then this LPG is actually a limit of a projective space. In fact, the projective space of sections of uh, my linear series. Mm -hmm. To show this, we use the coma colonies. So, so that's a, a, a sort of a, an extension of a work that was done by Brian Osserman. In fact, it was translated by Santana but basically what Brian Osman does is this, uh, this statement here for n equals to one. This is uh, what uh, this, this property here is what Brian Osman calls the flatness of the linked grass model. It not only considered uh, sub-representations of dimension one, but sub-representations of any dimension. We haven't done that so far, but for dimension one, that sort of extends and generalizes the work by Brian Osser. It does tell us that also this LPG is interesting. It's, it's, it's uh, the right thing to look at in a sense. So I've been talking about divisors. Let's talk about the dual picture in the next five minutes. Uh, that's a, a work that uh, uh, we started uh, more recently, so not much was done yet, but the, the, the general picture I can tell you. In fact, what we have with uh, Pierre Rodriguez is this theorem here, which corresponds to the case where the number of uh, components is equal to two. I, I have to say that maps haven't been studied a lot in the theory. So Brian Osterman never considered the maps, for instance. So this case here, uh, uh, it might look a very simple case, but it's still an original case. Okay. So if I have uh, my link in the net arising from a degeneration of a linear series, then uh, what we showed is that, uh, first of all, if I take the dual and I look at the quiver Grassmannian of pure dimensional representations, dimension one, then that's also a problem. And then also a limit. And the uh, second thing is that there is a rational map from the curve to LPG dual. It's defined except for a finite number of points. And I can tell you what this is in the example, which is not two components, it's three components, but uh, yes, I can, uh, we can do examples. And uh, that's uh, LPG dual for you. So that's the dual of LPG. It might not be easy to see geometrically, but once you have the representation, you take the dual and you just see what LPG dual is. So what we have here, we have P2 instead of P2 dual. So in P2, we have our triangle, remember, right? And what we do is different. We keep the P2 and what we do is we pick three other P2s and blow up each of them at a point. We get the Hitzebrook surface F1, which has an exceptional divisor, and we glue that F1 
to uh, one of the lines of the triangle. Okay, so we use that exceptional divisor to glue F1 to P2 uh, at the line. The intersections uh, between each of these F1s is just a single point. So I drew them curved like this, right? And uh, that's LPG dual. So you see, it's, it's very different from LPG. It's not isomorphic to it. And here I mentioned that there should be a map, right? From X to LPG dual. So I should be able to see my triangle there. And here's the triangle. It's this red curve here. You see, I mean, when you, Take the blow up, F1 becomes a ruled surface, and you can actually project each point of F1 to this line here. And uh, the image of X that we get is this curve here that projects to the triangle in P2. So, as a shadow, you have the triangle, but you have more information when you look at it uh, in this surface. And what kind of more information we can get by looking at it? Right. So, for instance, you can look at uh, the limits of flexes. Right. You cannot see the, the limits of flexes in the triangle, right? The triangle is, is, is straight. I mean, it doesn't flex, right? It doesn't inflect. I don't know how the verb is. But uh, you can see that in this, uh, this red curve. Right. And what you get, if you look at it, is that uh, the limits of the flexes are the three inflection points on each component of the triangle of the map to corresponding F1. In fact, we have a, a map to F1. I forgot to say what these, these, these red curves are. So they are images of P1, of course, images of the triangle. And this is the map that we use. You see that F here is that uh, general cubic right, that we use to, to make the pension. And uh, in fact, what I'm describing here is the map to P2, right? This map here has an image as a, as a nodal cubic. And when you blow up, you get a, a, a rational curve. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the branches are here. And you get exactly three inflection points. In fact, if you look at uh, the nodal cubic, what you get is nine inflection points here, but six of them for a general nodal cubic are concentrated on the node. And there are three others, which are the three points that I'm talking about. It's also possible to look at the flexes by looking at the divisor. So let's go back to the original surface, the LPG. You might ask how many of these divisors that I'm parameterizing here, uh, they are supported in a single point. So they are three times a point. So that's the condition for the point to be a flex, right? And if you look at these divisors here, so you see that uh, there are the divisors parameterized by P2 minus the three points, which certainly cannot be supported on a single point, right? There are those that are parameterized by this, this line here. And you see that they are of this form here. And again, they cannot be a... Uh, a single point. So in fact, the, the flexes will arise from the divisors that you consider here on P2 minus this line here, right? And uh, here it's a situation where you can have the, the three points. Notice that if F is general, none of these three points is the node. So the nodes are not limits of inflection points, something that uh, was already known uh, for a general uh, uh, pencil. Yeah. So that's one of the things that we can do in, the, in this situation. So before I finish, just one minute to say that uh, uh, that's a question that uh, has been asked to me. Uh, for those of you that are interested in higher dimensional varieties, uh, it's possible to do something. In fact, you can look at everything I talked about here and say, take a product of, with P1. Right? Then you get surfaces and you can do exactly what I did here. Right? The thing is that what we've been striving to do here is to get a general picture of the moduli of stable curves. And uh, we have a nice moduli for curves. As for surfaces, uh, things are get more complicated. So we have, haven't been working on higher dimension. But if you have a particular example that you want, uh, 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 I, I can say something about it maybe. 
Okay, so that's the end. Thank you for your attention. Good luck. Are there uh, questions or comments to Eduardo? Yeah. Uh, hi, I, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Eduardo, you said that you have defined for uh, your ideal shifts a uh, notion of stability, right? Yes. yes. And, and then you say that your ideal shifts lives in the space of representation of quivers, uh, if I am, if I understand it correctly. Uh, so, no. Uh, okay, but but please continue. I'll try to explain. Uh -huh. Yeah, my, I would like to know if there is a no uh, equivalence of no of this notion of stability that you have defined. Uh, if you think you can find a notion of stability uh, like uh, stability of quivers by King, uh, in, in in a way that your uh, ideal shifts or your objects that are stable uh, are equivalent to. Re Stable representation of quivers, data representations of quivers. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, yes, there is a notion of uh, stability for quiver representations. I haven't been looking at it. In fact, uh, uh, when I talk about representations here in the quivers, I'm thinking about just the vector spaces. Right? But it's true that uh, you also have a representation in the category of sheets. Right, so so actually every every point of uh, of this quiver corresponds to a sheep, and you have maps between the sheets. In fact, uh, you get a representation in that category, and uh, you might want to consider semi-stability conditions. Uh, that's not something that uh, we've been uh, uh, studying actually. So. The, the notion of semi-stability is not one that I introduced, it was uh, there for some time already. Maybe if it appeared first in, in the work by Odin Seixadri, it was used by Caporazzo. And uh, what we've been trying to do here basically is to do a way of uh, considering semi-stable sheets. So instead of considering the semi-stable limit with respect to a certain uh, polarization, we consider all of them. And that seems to be necessary uh, to address this question about limits of divisors because you, you don't get uh, one single sheep that it's important. In fact, you have to look at uh, several sheets, like, uh, like I have here the drawing, maybe uh, the example. Right, yeah. So, so you see here, if for in order to consider the limits of the divisors in this picture here, you have to consider four different limits. Right, and then these are not, of course, I mean, these are semi-stable with respect to different polarizations. So I, I, we haven't been focusing too much on, on semi-stability, but it appears in the description and appears nicely in the description of the collections of sheets that uh, we want to consider. So, so the, the basic answer is, is no, but uh, it could be interesting, but I, I don't see the usefulness for the purpose that, uh, that uh, for the goal that we have. Yeah, uh, the, 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 I think uh, you, you could, uh, the usefulness I think uh, comes from the fact that if you are able to find such a, a correspondence, you can think, you can try to look for the um, limits that appear in the category of representation of quivers. So, okay. You have new objects, maybe not uh, okay, but they will not. Uh, yeah, they will have no. Maybe they will have no geometrical description. I think, but okay. Mm. Thank, thank you very much for your answer. Right, right. One thing that I have to say is that I've I've talked about these ZN quivers uh, below here. Right, these are actually infinite quivers, the infinite number of vertices, and the quivers are all the same. All ZN quivers for a given n are the same. What varies is the representation. Right? So the representation might have support on, on different collections of vertices. And uh, so, so, yeah, so in a sense, that way you can consider this, this support and uh, you have different quivers that appear. But 
Yeah, I haven't uh, really looked at uh, it in that in that direction. Might be interesting. I see. No. So the n is the number of uh, components minus one, or the, the Min number minus of one. Minus exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so your your theorem in the end. So the theorem that you stated is for n equals to two, right? And you, right, also so mentioned, you also mentioned some results for n equals to one. So what, what about higher n? Is there right. a... So there is uh, some work that uh, we have been doing with Oliver Lorscheid. So there is a, a, a notion, for instance. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a different result, but, but it's maybe the only result that we have so far. So if you have a, a linked net over a ZN theater that admits a simple basis, which means that the representation is decomposed into a sum of uh, one-dimensional representations, then we are able to show that this LPG that appears here, which lives in the product of the project spaces, uh, is a deformation of the small diagonal. So it has the same Hilbert polynomial of the small diagonal, and this is a limit of a projective space. Mm -hmm. But that's a special kind of representation, those that have a simple basis. Uh, uh, Vital has an example that shows that, uh, 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 I mean, there are limit linear series that don't have this problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. but that's, uh, we hope uh, actually to have a, a, a statement like that for a gender N, but mm -hmm. we haven't been able to, to handle the combinatorics uh, yet, so. Okay, thank you. So are there more questions for Eduardo? Eduardo? Yes. Hi, it's Marco. Uh, okay. could, could you take the last picture? Uh, so the one of... Uh, okay, just close your eyes. And we'll yes. Uh, so this one here? Yeah, yeah, the one of the flex, the inflection points of the, so the three the, lines. The, the, yes, the, the, this, one this one, yes. Uh, so could you explain it? bit better so the three uh, purple points are the limits of uh, inflections of uh, smooth cubics is it right or uh, along this pencil along the pencil so yeah you see that, why, uh, why why the need to take this uh, f2 surfaces i mean you you have these points inside the triangle right or or not right why, why are... right yeah you can project them right i mean okay this and, is, and, uh, yes mm -hmm. And the projected are the limits of the inflections exactly. of, uh, okay. Uh, and then the, the pencil. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. oh, okay, so I guess that the tree appears with uh, multiplicities and you could uh, count this with uh, multiplicity tree, each one of these three right, points. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so what happens here in this picture is that I can, I can tell which are these inflection points by looking at the geometry of, of this picture here. So oh, okay. this, this curve flexes here, the, it inflects. So, so where it inflects are these actually the same. Ah, okay. yeah. So in a okay. sense, you can say that uh, I'm actually looking at uh, four maps to P2 at the same time, right? Because uh, I can have, uh, what I can do is the following. If I have the triangle here, I can project the triangle to the, not to F1, but to P2, right? So if I project, I'll have trouble projecting this line here, right, from this point, right? Uh, but actually this line is gonna be contracted to the P2. So basically what I have here is uh, the, the, the same triangle mapped to, to the four P2s, right? Uh, into three of these P2s, I get the inflection points. But in this picture, I have uh, uh, all of these maps in the same picture, in the same surface. And that surface is a degeneration of P2. So, I see. So you can do it for other projective curves or, or other plane curves? Yes, or, yes. So I mean, maybe as I said, it's a technique to find limits of inflections. It, it could be. You see that, uh, uh, that embedding depends on the pencil, right? This F that appears yeah. here. Mm -hmm. so, so, so depending on the pencil, you have different, uh, different uh, curves that appear here, yeah. right? And, uh, and it's, it's a general thing, actually. We haven't been able to, to say much more about it. I mean, the general theory has been restricted to two components so far, right? But uh, 
Yes, we've been trying to, to do some work here because uh, in general, the map is rational. It's not defined anywhere. And then you have to ask uh, what are the base points. And then you should ask whether there is a Riemann row that you can use to actually study these kind of maps. So this is just starting to. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, any more questions for Eduardo? So if not, uh, let's thank Eduardo again. Okay. Okay.